Good morning everyone and welcome to the Restore live stream. So glad that you've tuned in to watch us today and it's great to have the opportunity to share God's word with you. You will have noticed I still have my jet ski bruise on my chin. Not really that it's taking such a long time to uh, heal, although I'm always open to uh, um, uh, messages of sympathy and, uh, and surprise gifts drop round to the house um, just to check that I'm okay. It may have more to do with the fact that we pre-recorded this, as you might know from the same pullover as a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, I'm really enjoying doing this current series. Uh, we've called it Relevant, and really what we're looking at is what Jesus might have to speak into a number of uh, big issues that we wrestle with in everyday culture. You know, I think sometimes it's easy to think, well, Jesus lived 2,000 years ago in a different culture at a different time, so maybe the things that he taught about aren't relevant in the same way as they are today. I think that's a big, big, big mistake. And I think what we need to do as a church is uh, takes God's words, takes some of the teaching of Jesus, the principles and practices we see in the Bible, and then say, given the context that we do live in in 21st century, which obviously is different from the time that Jesus was uh, physically walking on the earth, um, but how can those principles apply into today's society? And how can I live as a follower of Jesus today? And I, I think to uh, match those two things up in terms of applying the biblical principles into my everyday life is the real key for strong discipleship and I hope the church is a safe place to have some of these conversations. I hope you enjoyed Dustin uh, last week speaking on the whole issue of, of uh, sexuality and, uh, and as a church carrying the heart of Jesus as opposed to um, being influenced just by the culture of the day or the prejudice of the day. Um, so today we're picking up on another issue. Today we're talking about poverty and inequality. And um, for, for me, that's a massive issue. It was an issue at the time of Jesus. Um, interesting, um, I think poverty and inequality has always been an issue in society because we so easily get sucked into living for ourselves rather than living for others. And, and because of that, we end up so quickly and so naturally creating a society that's based around inequality. Um, and if I'm going to start by reading one of my favourite bits of uh, scripture. Uh, when Jesus uh, first outlined his mission here on earth in Luke chapter 4, he used it by quoting Isaiah 61. So I'm going to read a few verses from Isaiah 61. We get our name from Isaiah 61 verse 4 um, as, uh, as a church restore. Um, I'm not going to go that far, but I'll read starting Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. It's a great passage of scripture, uh, great uh, words in it. But you know what? When Jesus spoke that in Luke chapter four, he wasn't just speaking metaphorically. The history of, uh, of Isaiah 61 is it spoke back to a part of the Jewish culture and society that was uh, uh, <coughs> set up by the godly principles in, uh, in the time of Moses, which was all to do with the year of Jubilee. And actually it is a proclamation of what Israel was meant to live out when they celebrated the Jubilee. Now you might be asking, what is the Jubilee? We're, I guess we're used to it with our uh, uh, dearly departed queen, uh, went through a number of Jubilees, didn't she? Um, in Israelite uh, society, it was written into their laws that every 50 years they would have a year of jubilee. Now, every seven years they would celebrate a, a, a kind of Sabbath a year, but uh, after seven sevens, 49, they would have a Sabbath year and they would leave the uh, uh, crops uh, fallow or the fields fallow, uh, which is a, a chance to recover. Um, but they then, and after every seven sevens, after 49 years, they then have an extra year's Sabbath, kind of like a bonus Sabbath year. But this would be the year of Jubilee and was a big deal in Israelite history. And the whole idea is it would be celebrated with a fanfare, trumpet fanfare, uh, through the land. And in the 50th year, slaves would be set free. 
everyone would have their debts cancelled and they would return back to their original place of living. And the whole idea was when the nation of Israel was set up, everyone was given a portion of land and a place to live. You find that in the conquest of the promised land, um, the land was split into the tribes and every family, every household, every person would have a place to live and, and an equal status in the community. And what God understood was over the next 50 years, uh, being given that, over the next 50 years, some people would prosper really well because they're gifted as kind of entrepreneurs, money makers, whatever else. Some people would, would uh, have um, experience uh, significant hardship and out of it, they would end up losing what they had. And the plan was every 50 years, you'd go back to the start. Uh, so those that had made a lot of money would then give it away, they'd return it. Those who'd ended up in, in slavery having to earn a, a, a living by working for someone else, they'd be set free from that and re-given their freedom and their status in society. So when in Isaiah 61 it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor, it is literally that the situation of the poor would be changed, that their debts would be cancelled. When it talks about binding up the brokenhearted, it's what you've lost is now going to be restored to you. It's going to be given back to you. Freedom for the captives, those held captivity in captivity would be set free and there would be a restoration of inheritance. And the whole idea was that the nation of Israel would really, 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 truly represent a different social structure and pattern of living. Now, interestingly enough, if you track through Israel's history, Israel never actually fully lived out any jubilee. So even within the first 50 years, such were the vested interests in society, such was the power of that, the power of wealth, that actually people weren't willing to give up their status and their money and uh, what they'd made over the, over the last uh, 50 years. So never was it fully um, uh, embraced and worked through. When Jesus comes, it's no accident that he calls uh, out and declares the Jubilee. And of course, in, in Jesus, you can apply it to our sins being forgiven. Uh, he, he talks, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about being slaves to sin, being in bondage to sin. So, uh, and you can talk about it in terms of our sin being our debts cancelled. You can talk about it on that level. But actually, when you look at how Jesus lived, Jesus did more than just do something spiritual for people. When you go through the life of Jesus, you find that he constantly went to the vulnerable, to the outcast, to the disenfranchised, to those who were uh, living under the power of sickness. You know, there was no um, social support system for those living in sickness. They'd be reduced to beggars. Jesus was always transforming the whole life situation for individuals. And yes, he did forgive their sins. Yes, he did make a way for them to be restored with, to God. But he also radically changed their pattern of life and their everyday situation. And you see, because the, the gospel is good news to the poor, if we're going to follow the model of Jesus, we need to carry a heart for those that do not have. Interesting thing I uh, read uh, recently as I was doing a Bible study. Um, was if you track through in the Old Testament, um, you find in Genesis chapter 4, verse 10, when um, uh, Cain kills Abel, I always get that the wrong way around, but that's right, isn't it? The, the, the um, sons of Adam and Eve, when Cain um, gets angry with his brother Abel and puts him to death, in Genesis 4, verse 10, um, God says to um, Cain, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. It's quite a strong phrase, isn't it? The blood crying out from, from the ground. But what the, the spilled blood of Abel does is it cries out to God for justice to be done, for justice to be restored, for uh, God to move and, uh, and bringing end to injustice and inequality. It's the first uh, act of violence um, in the Bible. Then in Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 to 21, talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, it says the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they've done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. And Sodom and Gomorrah 
um, and referenced this in, into the um, last week's talk, um, but Sodom and Gomorrah often, I, I think, there's a um, thought that they were destroyed um, because of the sexual uncleanness that was happening um, in the city. Actually, when he tracks through the Bible, as uh, references in, in Ezekiel and other parts to it, that actually in Sodom and Gomorrah, there was a very corrupt social system and it was the injustice in the social system which was why they were wiped out. Not because of the sexual uh, uncleanness or, and in particular, um, homosexuality. Um, but what it says in Genesis 18 is it says the injustice, God speaks, the injustice was an outcry that reached him. And again, outcry stirs the heart of God so that God goes down to investigate and do something about it. And then in Exodus chapter 2, uh, the start of the story of uh, Israel coming out of slavery into freedom, it says in verse 23, 24, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning. And in Genesis 4, Genesis 18, and Exodus 2, the same word is used for outcry. And in each of those situations, injustice causes an outcry that precipitates a move of God. Injustice causes an outcry that precipitates a move of God. And I think at the time that Jesus uh, came from heaven to earth, it was because there was injustice, inequality, that caused an outcry, that caused a move from God. And we need to understand, if we're going to carry the heart of Jesus and reflect it today, we need to be serious about seeing inequality and injustice dealt with. I'll give you some stats in terms of, of current uh, inequality. Because you see, one of the lies early on in the system, in the series, we talked about honesty and integrity, truth and lies. One of the lies that prevails is that we're a really advanced culture, that we, um, uh, we're more intellectually developed um, than any previous time. And, and out of that, we have this, uh, this kind of lie that we're more superior than any time. When actually, when you look at contemporary culture, I think we're more selfish, we're more depraved, we're more corrupt than ever before. And do you know what? We're more unjust and um, uh, have greater poverty than maybe ever before as well. So current stats, okay? 10% uh, of the world's population own 76% of the wealth. 10% of the world's population own 76% of, of the wealth um, and account for 48% of global carbon emissions. So going back to week one where G talked about caring for the environment, but the top 10% of the wealthy part of the world, we uh, are responsible for 48% of global carbon emissions. In 2022 in the UK, Households in the bottom 20% of the population had on average an equi um, a disposal income of £13,218, while the top 20% had £83,687. So uh, what's that? That's £70,000 more. The top 23, uh, the top 20% earned compared to the bottom 20%. Um, also, we know there's huge inequality within the UK as well. Um, it, it, the South East uh, has 45% of the economy of the UK and 42% of the wealth. Um, do you know, modern slavery is uh, larger than ever before. Global estimates 2021, 49.6 people living in situations of modern slavery on any given day. Let's just pause a minute and, and take note of that. 49.6 million people currently living in modern slavery. The population in the UK is, what, 70 million? So nearly the equivalent of the population of the UK today living in a situation of modern slavery. And you see, the issue is, if it doesn't happen under our nose... We ignore it, out of sight, out of mind. And yet, if we're called to be good news to the poor and bring global translation, transformation, we need to not be blind or deaf to the cries and the needs 
of the disadvantaged, the marginalised and the disenfranchised. So how should we respond as followers of Jesus? What does Jesus model and teach about this? Well, I, I, I think three things. I think, number one, Jesus taught a different value system around money. Jesus taught a different value system around money. Number two, Jesus taught, taught a different value system around community. And number three, Jesus taught a different value system around generosity. So Jesus taught a different value system around money. In the Sermon on the Mount, which is where Jesus does the first um, teaching uh, about what it is to be a disciple, a follower of him, uh, one of the things he talks about in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. And in the same flow of uh, scripture, he says you cannot serve both God and money. What Jesus says is where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you want to see where your heart is, look at where your treasure is. In other words, if you want to know what is really important to you and your life, look at how you spend your money. In fact, I think the two best indicators of what really, really is important to us is how we spend our money and how we spend our time. Because how we spend our time will tell us what we really invest ourselves in, how we spend our money will tell us what we really invest ourselves in. Now, so if we wanna be really countable as followers of Jesus, um, really what we should do is, is have someone that we can share our bank balance with or our bank account with, to uh, uh, our bank transactions, because that will get down to the nitty gritty about who we're living for. And you see Jesus, when he says you can't serve both God or mammon, says there's a power in money. And for many of us, like, like we live in a materialistic society, don't we? So everything is about what you have, how you look, uh, what you can put on show, but we also know that's quite hollow. Um, and uh, Jesus uh, taught about the fact that, that money is actually a tool to be used to bless other people, not just a means in itself. How many of us, we save up for a rainy day, and then you hear stories of people who saved up and saved up and saved up, but then something happened and they never got to the rainy day. Whereas Jesus turns a lot of that on its head in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. He says, give to the one who asks of you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. In other words, if you've got the means to do something about somebody's need in front of you, do it. And actually, at another point, Jesus says it, it, there's a greater blessing in giving than receiving. And actually, if you ever have been generous to someone in their time of need, you will know when you do it afterwards, you feel good about yourself. You feel good about the fact you've had an impact on somebody's uh, somebody else's life. You know, if you get caught in a cycle of, of, of buying things addictively, whether that be Imelda Marcos and shoes or chocolate or whatever your addiction is, but often you feel guilty by, oh, I shouldn't have bought that, that was an impulse buy, and we feel, we, we feel um, a sense of shame about it and guilt about it, whereas there's, there's a sense of liberty and pleasure and delight when we use our money to serve other people. In Luke chapter 12, when uh, Luke's comparable passage that talks about not serving God and money, he says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. When did you last hear this preached on in church? What's God speaking to you today? He's saying, I'll look down the barrel of the lens, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes and no moth destroys. You see, at one, at one point, we're going to have to face God face to face when we die. And when we face God face to face, he's going to call us to account for how we've lived. And what Jesus is saying is in those moments, you want to be able to say, God, the things that you blessed me with, the things that you gave uh, to me, God, I use them for other people as opposed to be fat, rich, lazy and self-centred. And we live in a society that, that makes its goal to be fat, rich, lazy, and self-centered. As followers of Jesus, we need to turn that on its head. Jesus says in, in Luke chapter 6, verse 9 as well, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. How do you spend your money? Can you honestly say, I'm not self-centered? 
know, um, many preachers through the years have pointed out the fact that the word sin has I in the middle. And most depravity in sin is, uh, has at its root I being in the middle, instead of serving Jesus being at the middle. Are you generous? Are you as generous as you could be? You know, uh, Chris and I, we've always tried to apply what we believe into how we've lived, including with our money. Lots of people argue over, over does tithing in the Old Testament, you know, does that still stand to the New Testament, tithing, giving you a tenth of your income? We've always given a tenth of our income into our local place of worship. And we've done it because um, if that was the minimum in the Old Testament, I'm at least in the New Testament going to do that and potentially more. And in the Old Testament, not only did they um, tithe, um, but also um, there were free will offerings uh, at, at other points of need as well. And there was a generosity to the poor in terms of people didn't harvest right up to the edge of their fields. They left some so that those who couldn't harvest for themselves would have something that they could glean. We've always, beyond what we've given to God in terms of our tithe, we've always given to other organisations, things like Beyond Ourselves, working to do education in uh, <coughs> Zambia and, and across uh, Africa. Um, we've always given to organisations like that. We've always given to people that we've been aware of in need. We've always supported other courses because our faith has got to be translated into action. And if we want to change the world, we've got to start with the way that we live. Actually, uh, John Wesley is one of my heroes in terms of biblical giving. Uh, what John Wesley used to do is one of my heroes in, in lots of ways. What, what John Wesley used to do is he used to work out the minimum he could comfortably live on for a year and then give everything else away. The minimum he could live on to be okay each year and then he gave the rest of it away. So rather than kind of have his, his, his tithe and then keep the rest, um, he uh, did the opposite. He worked out the minimum he could live on and gave, out, gave away the rest of it. And you know, I think that is more a Jesus way to live. And I'll just, if you're, if you're listening today, has your faith translated itself into impacting your bank balance? Because if it hasn't, something's gone wrong in your discipleship and you're following through the practices of Jesus. And in contemporary society, do you know, <coughs> I'm struck by um, the lack of people these days who do um, exercise the principle of tithing. And I wonder why? Um, you know, I, I will give, maybe begrudgingly, but I'll give my taxes to um, the government because I know that our uh, social society needs that money to be paid. If God's given me everything, you, you see, the giving the tithing, it was a principle of, I give my first fruits to God because I'm saying everything I have belongs to you. And it wasn't just that I would give my tenth and I could do whatever I did with the, the other nine tenths. It was a statement of, all that I have is yours and I'm prepared to give everything else to you. And I'm amazed with a number of people who will withhold their tithe when they're not happy with everything about church. And I'm kind of like, but your tithe was never to church anyway. It's about you making a statement to God that this belongs to you. Or the people that don't even tithe, when they've got a bit of money, I'll spend it. Um, or, or I'll give it to the church. When I haven't got enough money, well, it doesn't matter, I'll just use it to go on holiday. And I'm like, no, this is, this is about character, it's about submission, it's about uh, 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 letting uh, my faith impact the uh, way that I, I live day by day. And you know, through the years, it's, see, I could have earned a load, load more money with different career choices. I used to work for BP in the city. I was on their fast track graduate program, earned a lot more in my early 20s virtually than I've ever earned since. But you know, I've had a much richer, more rewarding life ever since than if I'd stayed working for BP, earning a big bank balance. I don't regret any one of my decisions. And you know, we've never been without through all the years. God has always provided. We went through a number of years where neither of us had a salary. Both of us were living by faith. God's always provided. And uh, I can live here, not yet 60, um, and uh, we're mortgage free and we're debt free because God honours the steps we make in faith when we seek to live out in obedience to him. So number one, we need to live by a different code. We need to live by a code that all that I have is God's and I'm going to use it to serve the vulnerable and, uh, and the, the needs of the gospel going around the world, not just myself. Number two, we need to live a different way in terms of how we care for one another. 
I'm always struck by um, the uh, model of the New Testament church. We find it in Acts 2, we find it again in Acts chapter 4, where it says, all the believers were of one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own. They shared everything as they had. And uh, we find the early chapters of, of, of Acts, loads of people came to become followers of Jesus. And I think they were drawn into the generosity of community. In fact, Acts chapter 4, it talks about everyone was sharing um, all that they had with one another. You then get the story of Barnabas, and the first reference to Barnabas. Barnabas means the son of encouragement. He's the one who mentors, trains, and develops the apostle Paul. But the first reference to Barnabas is he has a piece of land that he doesn't have need for, so he sells it and he lays the money at the apostles' feet to use to sustain the church, to care for one another. And that opens a doorway to blessing for Barnabas' life. And we track from that moment on his spiritual growth. Then it goes on to a story of Ananias and Sapphira. And Ananias and Sapphira, they also have a bit of a land. They also sell it, but then they lie. Let's track back to Truth and Lies that we did a few weeks ago. Then they lie about how much money they got for it. And they try and deceive the leadership of the church. And the next thing that happens is God moves and they drop down dead. And you see, lying, deceiving, holding on to are all things that close down the work of God in your life. Being generous, free, open-hearted opens a doorway to God's blessing. And in the early church, when the Spirit was really moving, because that community carried the heart of God, money meant nothing to them. Caring for one another, embracing one another, embracing the poor and the marginalised meant everything to them. And I'm so um, desperate to see a church live by a different rhythm than the rhythm of the world. And we live by a rhythm where we really, really care for one another. You know, contemporary society is incredibly individualistic and we don't view ourselves as being part of a community. One of the things that's uh, marked out the nation of, uh, of Israel through the years, from the very earliest days, and, and when I talk about Israel, I'm not talking about borders and um, boundaries and, and the actions of modern Israel. I'm talking about the culture of the, the Jewish culture, which is a very corporate, together, family-centered, tribal culture. And that they have that sense of belonging to one another. And what we've done is we, we've broken that down. We tend to talk about the church as if it's a building, when the church is actually a body, it's a community, and we're part of that community. And the, the language in the Bible is about being brothers and sisters with one another, not just being individual participants in an event. And one of the ways we need to ask God to change our community, uh, our sense of community, is, is that we might once again have interconnected lives where we truly weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, that we care for, that we love, that we embrace, that we make family with one another. You know, Theresa May a few years ago appointed a minister of loneliness. One of the chronic needs in the UK at the moment is the need for connection and community. And we need to model that by letting God set us free from our grip of possessions and self-interests and bring us back into that sense of we're part of a loving community. And Jesus said, didn't he, by our love one for another, the world would see that we were his disciples. The world would see that we're different because we're living by a different rhythm, a different tempo, a different style of living. And then the third thing is we need to have generosity when we see need around us. So we need to live by a different value system in terms of money and possessions. We need to live by a different value system in terms of community uh, amongst ourselves as the church. But thirdly, we need to be generous to the world around us. Let, let me just read a passage from Matthew 25. I'm not, sh not sure I can remember the last time I heard somebody read this in church. And it's Jesus talking about the end times and how to get a reward from heaven and how to attract the pleasure of God. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. In the time of Jesus, it was not easy to distinguish between sheep and goats. You had to look closely to discern the difference between um, them from their coats. He will put the sheep on his right, that's the sign of, side of favour and blessing, 
and the goats on his left. I'm doing it the wrong way round for you probably. You're watching this saying that's the wrong way round. That's because I'm facing the camera. You're watching it. Um, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he'll say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He'll reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they'll go away to eternal punishment, but the righteousness to eternal life. Quite a passage to reflect on, isn't it? When did you last give some money to a homeless person on the streets? When did you last visit someone in prison? When did you last give something that you had that cost you to give it to someone else? And yet Jesus is saying, if you know me, and you carry my heart, that's how you ought to live. One of the things that's most impressed me in all my years of Christian ministry has been spending a, a couple of weeks with Jackie Pullinger, working in Hong Kong with the poorest of the poor and a whole history of working with heroin addicts and uh, uh, boat, boat refugees. Um, and what has so impressed me about uh, Jackie is she's a lady now in her 80s who has given everything for the sake of those who have nothing and is still as adamant in her 80s to live as radically and ruthlessly for Jesus as ever before. And I love that, love her book, Chasing the Dragon, that details the story about the detail of that. But I've always been inspired by that because that is a model, I think, of how we ought to live, like a modern day, guess, Mother Teresa. So if we're gonna live like Jesus, what does it mean for um, social justice and uh, our finances? Well, I think it means uh, four things. Number one, we need to pray for those that have not. One of the ways you can tell what you care about is what you pray about. For most of us, I bet we pray about our things, our family, our situation. What about praying for the world? Tear Fund does some amazing stuff, amazing prayer guides to pray for different nations, different uh, parts of society, uh, different needs in, in global uh, uh, poverty, inequality. Secondly, we need to act. What about sitting down and doing a fresh budget? and deciding or asking God, God, what should I give to you? And what should I give to the wider world? Number three, think about taking some action over a situation of injustice. Maybe it's in your local community, maybe it's in global. If you don't know what to do about it, Heidi Chow is a great member of uh, Restore, uh, leads an organization called Debt Justice that campaigns in terms of third world debt 
and uh, you can go on their uh, website and they'll tell you some ways you can get involved and uh, campaign on global uh, transformation. And then fourthly, uh, try and uh, influence the systems and structures and societies, whether that's volunteering uh, to make a change. Maybe you want to volunteer for the local food bank. Maybe you want to um, write a letter to your MP about something that's important. Maybe you want to become a local councillor. You know, we need to be the change, not just preach the change. You know, Jesus started his proclamation about what he was called to and said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to be good news to the poor. This morning, we are anointed with God's spirit that we might be good news to the poor. How can you be poor, good news to the poor on your doorstep? And how can we be good news to the poor globally? Big issues, but they will only change when individuals like you and me decide we're going to live by a different tempo and a different rhythm and we model the example of Jesus and we become sheep rather than goats. We become sheep led by our good shepherd rather than goats cast out into the cold because we never put into practice the heart of Jesus in how we live. Let's pray. Lord, I know this is a big topic and sometimes big topics, they just feel kind of overwhelming because they're so big. And I know, Lord, that uh, maybe I've said quite a lot of tough things today. Lord, I pray for everyone listening and watching. Lord, I pray that these words, that your words, won't just bounce off rocky ground. But Father, the ground of our hearts might be good soil to receive the seed of your word, that your word may be able to take root and grow. Lord, where in any way that I've become hard or my heart has got callous or I've grown cold in terms of caring for the needs of others, Lord, I repent. I ask that you'll forgive me and I ask, Lord, that you'll restore to me a heart like yours. Lord, I want to live my life such that when I'm confronted by need, when I see a homeless person, when I see someone that does not have, when I meet somebody at the school gate that needs, Lord, I don't just want to close my eyes and close my heart and walk on by. Lord, I want to be the one that is prepared to be the answer to your prayers and my prayers and the one that makes a difference. Lord, may injustice horrify us and motivate us to take action, to be the change. Will you set us free from being I-focused, me-focused? Set us free from the power of mammon and may we, need, may we learn to live a different way in Jesus' name. Amen. I really want to encourage you. Thank you for joining with us today. Um, don't just be hearers of the word. Be a doer of it. Why not go away and really, really spend some time, diary some time this week to wrestle with God and to say, God, what are you saying about how I spend my money, about how I spend my time? God, what do I need to, uh, to change? You know, if God says to you, give all your money away, then um, ian.king at restorecc.org.uk, send it to me. I'll <laughs> happily receive it and do something good with it. Partly joking. Um, but um, really, really, let's be generous and let's follow through and be people of action, not just talk. We'll uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you for joining us.